the psalmist, Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The mountains are his also. Some of you may remember that as being part of actually our church liturgy. It's called the Venite. Venite, Latin for to come. One of the places we lived, Seattle. Don't worry, this isn't the story about the lumberjack again. <laughs> but it is a mountaintop story. I'll tell you what, from Seattle, from almost anywhere in Seattle, you're surrounded by mountains. You have the Cascade Mountains. You have the Olympic Mountains. And standing around them all, beautifully, is Mount Rainier, standing 14,000 feet in the air. I remember we had moved from Florida to Seattle, and one of uh, the young men that uh, our son John knew, our son John and Eric both knew, came with us. He had never left Florida. And this was in July, and in the middle of July, there was still snow to be seen, and he was just, like, amazed. I'll tell you what, this was like the time we lived there. This was like an every weekend visit. Of course, the end of the day would come, and what we would have to do, we'd have to pack everything back up in the car, head back on down into the valley, into the plain, and get ready for work, and get work for school. However, for me, I was at SeaTac, the airport there. They had, I had this panoramic view. I mean, as big as the wall was, one of the walls was of the Cascade Mountains. It was hard to leave that office because I actually I thought about those mountains kind of like all week long. They were always there and they were always snow-capped. But even that was nothing compared to the mountaintop experience by three of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't record that, but only Luke tells us why they go up the mountain. And it wasn't far <laughs> the scenic view that they could see. Jesus took with them Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. As he was praying, it appeared his face was altered, clothing became dazzling white. And now listen to what the disciples overhear Jesus, Elijah, and Moses talking about. Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Three disciples that go up with Jesus are standing in the presence of God. They're standing in the presence of the visible God in Jesus Christ and the invisible God, the Father. Looking back, frequently, you may remember or you've probably stumbled across the fact that Many times when God wants to get the people's attention, he takes them to a mountain. Our first reading hinted to this. Exodus, we now read, um, God had Moses bring his people to Mount Sinai. While they were there, God came down upon the mountain, right? And a cloud filled the sky with thunder and lightning. And he spoke with such authority that the people trembled. Everybody there got the attention of God. And then there was Elijah, the other man on the mountain, right? Jesus once again brought his people to a different mountain, Mount Carmel. What happens? Boom! Fire from heaven comes down from God. Eats up all of Elijah's sacrifice. God got the attention of them too. But wait. There's another experience that Elijah has, another mountaintop experience at Mount Horeb, which is actually Mount Sinai as well. The Lord passes by, and there's a strong wind that tore the mountains, broke the pieces all before the Lord. But if you remember, the Lord wasn't in the wind. Next, there's an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake either. Then a fire, and God wasn't in the fire either. But then, 
remember this? This is awesome. The sound of a low whisper. Yeah. You think God got Elijah's attention? Absolutely. Jesus will feed 5,000 plus people. Two fish, five loaves of bread. You all heard that, right? But did you realize where he's doing it? On a mountain. God got their attention. Jesus on the night he will be betrayed. He goes up on a mountain to do what? To pray. Taking the same three disciples with him. So at the Mount of Transfiguration, don't you think God got all the disciples' attention? Absolutely. In fact, it had such a powerful effect on Peter that he later wrote, which we heard in our epistle, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard the very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. In this writing, this recollection, Peter is declaring, I saw it. I touched it. I experienced it. Wait a minute. The holy mountain of God reminds me of another Old Testament mountaintop experience. Remember Moses and the burning bush? Yep, on a mountain on Mount Sinai, right? What does God say to him? Oh, yeah. Take off your sandals. You were standing on holy ground. Ground made holy by the presence of God. You know, come to think of it, I think the mountaintop experience that the gospel writer John writes about, was thinking about, this is what he wrote. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. I believe John is talking about that same mountaintop experience. Made manifest to us. How does the Christmas hymn go? God in man made manifest. Not too far along, right? I mean, it's only a couple months ago when we sang that. But God in man made manifest. For the three, understandably, seeing what they saw, hearing what they heard, they were scared out of their wits. They were in the presence of God. And all the Old Testament talks about the fact that you cannot see God and live. They are in the presence of God, frightened to death. But do you remember what happens? Jesus comes to them. What does he do? He just touches them. Yes, God touched them in Jesus Christ. The gospel we have before us today makes up for last week, so aren't you glad you came back this, this morning? Because we were almost gospel starved, if you remember last week in the reading of the very center of the Sermon on the Mount. Today, this is the gospel that you heard. You heard about the forgiveness of sins. When? During the conversation. Moses and Elijah say, his departure which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. The prophecy, the Son of God, would be crucified. And the key word is accomplished in Jerusalem. Also speaks of Jesus' future resurrection. Jesus says that he's taking the disciples down the hillside, remember, tells them not to tell anybody. Don't tell anyone until the Son of Man has been what? Raised from the dead. He's already telling them what's going to happen. 
Then we have the Father's endorsement of Jesus as God. This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then God the Father adds something just so that they can hear it and just so that they understand it, that Jesus is God's agent for salvation because what does he say? Listen to him. They got that? Absolutely. And then we have the appearance of Moses and Elijah showing us that heaven is for real. And I'm not talking about a fictitious book that some three-year-old child wrote way back when. Moses and Elijah, both long gone from the face of the earth, are still alive. And what do we call that? Eternal life. It's true. God is not the God of the dead, but God is the God of the living. That's the gospel that you heard this morning. Now is the gospel that you will see today. Because today you will see the very body and blood of Jesus Christ along with the bread and the wine. You will see it with your own two eyes. And what does it do for you? It gives you the forgiveness of all of your sins. I'm going to ask you to take back out Page 10, I want to read the fifth verse together of "'Tis good, Lord, to be here." Because sometimes when we sing a hymn, and I'm included in that, I don't pay a lot of attention to the words. So I went back through this this morning, actually, and kind of paid attention to this verse. Let's read it together, verse 5. "'Tis good, Lord, to be here, yet we may not remain. But since thou bidst us leave the mount, Come with us to the plain. Come with us to the plain. We are always standing in the presence of God. Now, God has our attention too. Thank you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.